You know something? I'm telling you, with all this crazy stuff that's on this lineup right now tonight, I can only imagine whether something really, really spooky is going to happen. And considering my luck, yeah, it's damn sure about to. Because, welcome to the J-Man Show here on J360 Radio. How's it going, J360 Legion? Ready for some more Monster Fest greatness? Welcome back to the J-Man Show for episode 352. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm loving week three so far, y'all. This is great. Like This whole Monster Fest session has been amazing, not to mention like some of the things that have taken place. And the horror movies. You know something? Uh, yesterday was pretty interesting, because remember when I told you guys about, you know, the... Uh, Theater of Terror. Well, there's a sequel to it called Return to the Theater of Terror, and this time, however, it seems to be a lot more Twilight Zone-ish than it does seem to be like how the first one was. The first one was just in your face, full of creatures and all sorts of bizarre stuff galore. And not to say that there isn't bizarre stuff in here, because from what I watched with Marco, Man, I never thought I would see something really, really crazy about a guy turning into a tree because of what his father did eons ago. Like, you know, the sins of the father stories are very interesting. And, like, when it comes right down to it, if your ancestor didn't do right, chances are you're going to have to pay for not only the messes you make, but the mess they made years ago. Which seems to be an ongoing thing in horror anyway, but... As soon as I noticed that Native Americans were involved, I was like, oh, this is not going to end well. And it certainly did not for the main character, even though he was a stupid moron throughout most of it. But, well, to be honest, that happens to a lot of protagonists in horror films, right? And, you know, sometimes they deserve it, and this particular character did. I would dive into the movie a little bit more, but a lot of y'all did not have the chance to see it, so I'm like this. If you ever get a chance, go on Tubi. Slaughter Beach is there, by the way. Shout out to Clock Out Films. And check it out sometime, you know? Like, really get a good look at some of these movies. Because I'm not hiding what is on the Monster Fest this year, you know? So, take the time to go ahead and look into those movies yourself and see what you think. And, you know, I don't mind you guys giving your own commentary about it. Like, honestly, I think both of those movies are really good. Because there's been a few stinkers. Such as, like, this one movie called Demented. Where, allegedly, it's, like, five different movies. But they're not really movies. Like, they're, they're pretty much our YouTube videos combined into one thing. Now, I see, like, when people do this kind of stuff, it's okay to get benefit of the doubt because a lot of people don't have resources to certain things and they have to work with what they have. And then there are some times where things just, they don't work. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it was a little bit of hit and miss there on that night of Monster Fest. But fortunately, I had Casper cartoons to kind of wipe out all of the feel. Oh, don't judge me. You know Casper's cool, especially this time of year. Shoot, he's a friendly ghost, man. You know what I mean? Shoot, he just wants some friends, that's all, you know? Be behind him every step of the way. And that Popeye cartoon where him and Olive Oil were out there on the sea, and they were on a haunted boat and stuff, and then, like, the ghost didn't want him there. But pretty much this is Popeye you're dealing with, and, you know, wherever he goes, let it be. Otherwise, you're getting your ass whooped. Well, after you hit him around a little bit, but you know what I mean. And it has been some cool stuff because during times where I'm not using the streaming networks, I'm sitting here looking at the Blu-rays and the DVDs I got. And of course, you know, I've been swimming through those Godzilla movies just like he was in Minus One. Which I hear that Minus One is actually supposed to be coming back to theaters in November for a little while. 
with 13 minutes of extra footage. So we're doing this again, huh? <laughs> oh my god. I, you know, it, damn. I, you know I gotta go see that, right? I just wish it was happening now. I would have loved it, but, you know, it also has, like, mul multiple releases here, too. Like, you know, you either get the one that has both the movie that's in color or the movie that's in black and white, which is also really cool for that 1950s feel. It just, it is a good Godzilla film. I remember somebody telling me this, that there's, like, too much dialogue in the movie. Well, I was like, I thought that was what y'all wanted because some of y'all didn't care for the movie that came out in 2019 over here on American Shores because too much monster. I don't know, man. See, some people you just can't please. You know how, like, you have that 70, like, if you look at it, like, 100%, right? Sometimes you aim for that 100%. Chances are you might get that 75 to 50%. You know what I'm saying? Because there's always going to be that 25% that just doesn't like you. Somehow they're there and present when you're doing stuff, but they, they just don't like you. They don't like your material. And, you know, they're still going to buy a shirt. So I guess that's a hollow victory at best. But, yeah, it is what it is. But, like I said before, the fact that that movie is going back in the theaters, I'm afraid I'm going to have to invest. <laughs> you know? In addition to, like, some stellar horror films did come out this year like long legs and um the substance and then of course how can i forget terrifier 3 i know a lot of y'all are looking at that like yes yes and i'm like you know right there with you because art the clown is the new icon of our time man and like whatever they're doing next because you know <laughs> he can't stay dead yeah, and I'm not even diving in and giving spoilers to it. It's just a very good film series. Now, I'm sure a lot of y'all are saying, so next year Art the Clown won't be involved, right? I didn't say that. I'm talking about the big three. Or big four if you're including uh, Ghostface from Scream. I'm talking about them. And maybe Chucky, so that's five. So it's like... I'm talking about not relying too much on them. Like, look at all the other creatures that we have roaming around here. You know, because, like I said, Godzilla's in here, and, like, all this Godzilla love that came into play because we were getting movies from both shores, you know, here in Western and over there in the Eastern, it's just been a good time to be a fan like that. So, like I said, as long as you have variety in what the creatures that are walking around are about to do, that's a fine thing, you know? Personally, I think we are at a loss because we should have got a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde film with Russell Crowe, a long time ago like like say what you will about that movie the mummy i mean with tom cruise in it and the way they were going about things it wasn't my favorite but let me tell you though that scene with dr jekyll and mr hyde that was fine i was like damn this should have been the movie you know what i'm saying and of course you know a lot of y'all see that anytime you see like um certain characters that take center stage in those shared universe movies you know Especially when it comes to the Universal Horror movies. It's just always like that. Or like, no, no, I want to see more of this. Not, not, damn this other plot right now. I want to see that. You know? And it gets hard sometimes. But I always look at it this way. Like, at least, you know, they had something there to tell us. And we could have went along with that. Now, however, when the universe did break up. And they had, and they had the Invisible Man with Elizabeth Moss in it. That was well done, too. And I remember, like, they were supposed to be making a new Wolfman coming out soon for all of us. Which, by the way, I mean, I know some of y'all are like, oh, do we have to go through Laurie Talbot's story again? But, yeah, to a point, I guess. But then again, it could be something completely different. And because I love werewolves, you best believe my black ass will be there. And while I'm going about this kind of stuff, I'm just letting you guys know how the Monster Fest has been going so far. And it's been going great. And not to mention, I found out new stuff that I can use with some of the other material here. So whenever I'm doing, like, you know, a secret stream, if you will, or some screenings, you guys can join in and, you know, drop in anytime you want to. So we can all, like, you know, make it a community thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, as I sit here and I tell you these things, a lot of those movies are public domain, so you ain't got to worry about, like, oh, my God, is he going to get in trouble? Oh, my God, what are we going to do? Nah. <laughs> but I am creating a monster of my own making. And while we're all about the subject here, you guys came for some nightmare tales. 
I could dive in there and tell you more about the business, or I could go ahead and hit you with some of the fears and chills. And I think we can go ahead and do that. You know, I, I went into a lot of stuff here regarding, you know, Western culture and a lot of our folklore and a lot of our urban legends and all. But, you know, we have worldwide urban legends. And as I mentioned about Godzilla before, there's plenty of Japanese urban legends to talk about in addition to some folklore as well. You know? <laughs> it just ends up that way sometimes. And speaking of which, if you look at some of the Godzilla characters, and even the big G himself, you know, they are based on different forms of demons, yokai, and all. So, it's a lot of things to look into there. And how we're going to start this whole thing off tonight is, you go get yourself some brews and some snacks, and I'll go ahead and I'll roll out the story. Matter of fact, the, all right, the first one that's going to be on our list tonight is called the Talking Futon. A long time ago, in a town in Tatori Prefecture, there was a small inn. One winter night, when one of the guests at the inn was sleeping, he suddenly woke up at midnight to the sound of human voices. Elder brother, you must be cold. Little brother, you must be cold. The voices were those of whispering children. Even though I'm out of sound 30. Well, now, where would children be at this hour, the guests wonder. They're not supposed to be anyone else in the room. Crawling out from under his futon, the guest peeped into the next door room to see what was going on. But it was completely quiet, and not a sound could be heard. That's strange, he thought. I'm sure I heard something. The man got back under his futon once again and tried to go to sleep, but this time he heard the voices quite clearly next to his ear. Elder brother, you must be cold. Younger brother, you must be cold. The guest was shocked and leapt to his feet. He hurriedly lit a lamp and there was no one else in the room. All he could hear was the sound of his own heart beating. With the lamp still glowing, the guest laid down on his side once again, and then came the sad whispering voices. Elder brother, you must be cold. Little brother, you must be cold. Somehow the voices seemed to be coming from inside the futon. The man shuddered in horror and brushed away the futon in panic, nearly falling over himself, leapt out of the room and ran into the innkeeper. What foolishness is this? You are probably just having a dream, the innkeeper exclaimed. No matter how the guests explained the situation, the innkeeper refused to believe him. On the contrary, he got very angry. Let's not drag this out any longer. Do me the favor of getting out of here. And with that, he drove the guests from the inn. The next night, however, a different guest staying in the same room also ran off at midnight telling the same story. This is something strange, the innkeeper thought. Could this be a ghost? The innkeeper went into the room himself and sat next to the futon for a while. Eventually, from the futon cover, sad voices began whispering, Elder brother, you must be cold. Little brother, you must be cold. The innkeeper turned pale and ran from the room. What an eerie futon, he thought. What kind of terrible shop would sell a futon like this? The next day, the innkeeper went to the used furniture store where he had bought the futon to make a complaint. There, he heard a sad story. On the outskirts of a town in the same prefecture as Totori, there lived a poor family of four. Some days before, after a long illness, the father had died in his sleep, and soon after, the mother had passed away. This left only an elder brother, six years old, and a younger brother of four, having no relatives to care for them. The brothers went day after day without anything to eat, and shivered from the cold and empty stomachs under a single futon. Elder brother, you must be cold. The affectionate younger brother would try to pull the futon over his older brother. Little brother, you must be cold, said the elder brother, who also returned the favor to put the futon over his little brother. But the cold-hearted landlord finally came, took the futon and placed the rent, and drove the children from the house. The two boys who had nothing to eat for days could not even walk. That night, as snow fell, they held each other in their arms under the eave of a nearby house and froze to death. When the people of the town found out about this, they pitied the two boys and laid them to rest at a nearby temple dedicated to Kanon. Is that what happened, the innkeeper said? What a miserable thing the landlord did. He promptly set out to visit the temple dedicated to Kanon and formally read a sutra for the sake of the two little boys. And it is said after that, the futon never spoke again.
All right, okay, you know, not bad. You know, a little creepy there with the young boys and all that stuff living in the futon, you know. But, you know, sometimes that's just what happens with restless spirits and, you know, a lot of eerie stuff like just just ghost alone are usually here with unfinished business. I mean, so after a while, you kind of wonder what could be the solution to the problem. It kind of reminds me of that movie, Mr. Vampire, where, you know, there was a legendary uh, vampire killer but you see the thing about it is the vampires are much different over there in the eastern cultures these were hopping vampires and he was a pretty good priest about it but he had two of the craziest assistants ever and they always were getting in something and then there was a little subplot where one of the <laughs> they were at the they were at the graveyard you know trying to put a lot of restless spirits to rest and there was a moment where, like, the one apprentice was sweet-talking, and he didn't know he was sweet-talking, but he was sweet-talking a grave that he shouldn't have, and then a ghost bride appeared. And the ghost bride thought that that was her, you know, fiancé or something torn away from her from years on end. She was a pretty ghost until you saw the real form, and she loved him so much she didn't care who he was. <laughs> you know, a little hilarity here, but it's still creepy because that is a dead woman. Let, let, let us just be, let us remember that it is a dead woman. But, see, the thing is, though, like, when the, uh, when the main vampire killer was actually doing what he had to do to put a stop to, like, the vampires that were hopping about, and not to mention, you know, help his apprentice not be haunted anymore... You kind of felt for the ghost bride because she really did enjoy his company. And when she vanished away, there was a whole sad story that, you know, didn't get resolved as good as you think it was. It worked for that movie, though, but you just feel for her, you know? And like any of them ghosts out there, they're not trying to hurt people. At least in this story, they're not. But, you know, considering it's Monster Fest, though, there's going to be plenty of hurt coming through. I can see it. And speaking of ghost brides, though, how about we dive into this story right here called Flowers of the Sweet Olive Tree. Long ago in a certain village in the prefecture of Tatori, there stood a single house owned by a samurai. One day an old man went to the house for a visit as he and the samurai had been friends for some time. The night was the time for moon viewing and there was a large round moon shined to its bright light in the garden. Why can they say full? The two men extinguished all the lamps and sipped sake on the veranda as they gazed at the moon. From time to time, the sweet fragrance of a sweet olive tree wafted on by a breeze. Ah, what a pleasant scent, the old man said as he looked over the garden. And just then, a young woman dressed in a white kimono appeared standing next to the sweet olive tree. Her long, disheveled hair fell over her beautiful, pale, white face and she stared fixedly in the direction of the two men. That's strange, the old man said. I must be getting a little drunk. He rubbed his eyes and started to stand up, but suddenly the woman came up and abruptly thrust her face in between the two men. The old man involuntarily let out a cry, but the samurai remained totally unafraid. Go on, get out of here, he yelled, or I'll cut you down. The woman glided away and hid behind the sweet olive tree. Dear me, the old man gasped as he breathed the relief. Oh, don't pay any attention to her, the samurai said to the old man as he filled up a cup with fresh sake. Here, drink your fill. But after a while, the woman appeared again, and this time started to walk back and forth in front of the veranda. Now the old man could not even think about his sake. He looked over at the woman and trembled over. The woman suddenly stopped in front of the two men, leapt onto the veranda, and glared and laughed at them. A shiver went down the old man's spine, and he was speechless. You still don't understand what I mean, the samurai yelled as he unsheathed his sword and slashed at the woman without warning. But the woman deftly defied the blows and moved away like the wind. Wait! The samurai jumped down into the garden barefoot and chased after the woman. At last he came back, puffing and out of breath. What an annoying wench, he complained and spat disgustingly on the ground. She might be a crazy woman, but it wouldn't be right to kill her, the man said. No, not at all. That woman's a ghost, the samurai replied. When night falls, she appears like this all the time, 
If I leave the door open, she comes right into my room and gets up on the futon. What are you saying? Are you afraid, the man asked? Of course I am, the younger man replied. Even a samurai is afraid of something like that, but I've become used to her. And no matter how I slash away with my sword, it never has any effect. If I chase her, she just runs away like the wind. Well, so that's what they call a ghost, but why do you suppose a ghost comes here? To tell the truth, I don't understand that myself. Hearing that, the old man was afraid to stay a moment longer. Thanking his host for the sake, he quickly went outside. The moon was still shining brightly down. As he went around towards the front gate, his eyes fell on the large, sweet olive tree that stood where the woman had been. A sweet and sour fragrance filled his nostrils. Just then he heard the sharp sound of a branch being broken. Wondering what was happening, he peered over towards the tree and saw the ghost was breaking off one of many branches of the sweet olive tree. The old man fled without another glance. After that, the ghost came every night and broke off another branch of the sweet olive tree, and by the time she has broken them all off, the tree had started to wither, and strangely enough, when it had withered completely away, the ghost no longer appeared. And soon after, the samurai passed away. Not bad. Woo. Okay. Well, you see, in a way, that's kind of, um, that kind of is analogous to what I was saying earlier about the ghost bride, you know? It's just like, there's a reason for that ghost to be there. And if anything, you know, most of the time they are looking for another lover. Most of the time they're looking to get their youth back. And like I said before, this is a dead woman. So at the same time, uh, 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 no, no. Ain't gonna be no way you be going ahead across the dimensional gates on this one. And if you say, what about Ghostbusters, I'm gonna slap you. But, you know, the truth is, it's like, how would that? No, I cannot think about it. It is very impure. And I purely love loving women. <laughs> but yeah, as we keep moving forward on this scenario, do not think about it. Do not even humor the idea. We move forward. But as we do, believe it or not, you can't just do these Halloween episodes without some variation of the Bloody Mary story. Now, get this, right? This is called Hanako-san. Anyone who grew up in the West knows the legend of Bloody Mary, who will appear if you say her name three times in a mirror in a darkened room. I don't suggest you try it. Like, you know, because if you've seen Candyman already, you pretty much know. But it's like this. This one, you have to go into an empty girl's bathroom. Knock on the door of the last cubicle three times, and then ask aloud, Are you there, Hanako-san? And when you open the door, you will see a young girl who was brutally murdered in a high school bathroom many years before. She always wears a red skirt. And if you go to jail and you have to serve 5 to 10 for doing something this ignorant as hell... <laughs> oh my god, that's scary within itself. Yeah, don't don't even try it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Matter of fact, like I gotta think about like what I'm doing here in form of a uh, role model, if you will. Of course, I love those horror stories, right? Where like a voyeur is actually running around trying to do all these things, and then they get their comeuppance. Me and Marco saw a movie not too long ago dealing with this same thing, where it was like five short films. No, it's not demented, but it might as well be. And <laughs> the last one was called The Protector. And this guy was trying to peek in on this beautiful woman, trying to, you know, score her underwear and all this other stuff. Used underwear, of course, because that's what perverts do. And as soon as he was trying to get more and more of it, he tried to actually go to the shower where she was, only for her to smile at him as a trap is sprung out and her protector comes in and pummels the shit out of him. And then they take him down into the basement and all. And there was this weird thing with a live stream where they showed the voyeur getting all torn apart and stuff like that. Penis first, of course. And, you know, that was the story. It's just like, I, I understand turning the tables on him. You know, you already got him and you already did that. That should be enough. But then there are times where some of the movie is going into overkill about it and then it just becomes cringe. And that's pretty much what happened in that story. But that doesn't count for another story I'm telling you guys tonight. Or does it? <laughs> and for those of you other men out there, I I'm in pain when I talk about that too. Moving on. Of course, who can forget about the most infamous ghost story? Oh, well, one of them. 
and it's called Red Paper. The Japanese children scare each other by repeating the tale of what happened to two schoolboys many years ago. One day, one of the boys went to the bathroom only to find there was no toilet paper in the stall. As he cursed to himself, he heard a voice asking whether he wanted red or blue paper. He answered red, and all the blood seeped out of his body so that he died in minutes. The story spread around the school. Some month later, the boy's friend found himself in the same toilet stall, and again, there was no paper. He heard the same voice ask what paper he would like. Knowing the story and remember what had happened to his friend, he chose blue. And gradually his throat began to tighten and soon he was struggling to breathe. And classmates found him dead. Blue in the face from suffocation. Yeah, <laughs> I told you, infamous, man. Very infamous indeed. How about this one? This one is about, you know, the highway system in Japan. Or at least one of them. A busy highway in Tokyo, Japan runs through a tunnel that lies underneath a very large and very old cemetery. The graveyard is not visible when driving a car underneath, but many drivers are said to have felt its presence over the years. A man driving back from a late shift at work one night narrowly avoided hitting what he sworn was a young mother with a small child. But after he managed to get his car under control and swerved to a stop, he saw there was nobody there. His friends blamed lack of sleep, but he was sure that there was somebody standing in the middle of the road. People in the know would say that he witnessed one of the sinister spirits emancing from the graveyard above and became trapped in the tunnel, stuck between this world and the afterlife. On more than one occasion, drivers, usually male, have described how they glance in their rear view mirror and caught sight of a young girl with long black hair on the back seat staring straight at them. If they managed to keep their car on the road and check again, they would find that there was nothing there. And others would report people hanging upside down or banging on car roofs and mysterious handprints and faces appearing on windows. The area's taxi drivers are particularly wary. All of them know the stories of cabs being held by people in the tunnel, only for them to disappear when the door is open. I'm going to need a drink, but let me just say this. <laughs> if you're listening on Red Circle, the ads are right here. Hmm, nope, we are not reading this story. This is Cow's Head, and we're not, we're not diving into that. Hell no. You know, not only that, because it said that the story is so cruel and so dark and dank, it would make the one that's reciting the story want to off themselves, and I got a lot of living to do, so let's just be as selfish as possible and say no. Uh, <laughs> however, this one is very interesting to me. It is called The Red Rum. A student was with some of his friends, and when someone asked him if he knew the Red Room, a strange pop-up, he answered that he didn't know it. But being an internet fanatic, he went straight home to look at it for himself. After looking for it for a while, the mysterious pop-up appeared on his PC screen. It was a small window with a completely red background on what was written in Japanese characters, Do You Like It? The boy closed the window, but it appeared again. The student closed it again, and closed it again, but it kept popping up each time, asking the same sentence. And then there was another sentence, Do you like the red rum? was formed. The boy could also hear the sound and the voice of a child repeating the question, even though his computer was set to mute. And at that point, the whole screen turned black, and a list of names appeared, and as he scrolled through it, he noticed that the last name was of that boy who told him about the Red Room that same afternoon, and soon after he lost consciousness. The next day, his classmates did not see him at school, and after class, they were told the terrible news. Their friend had committed suicide and painted the walls of his room red using his own blood. Legend says if you look for the Red Room on the internet, you might actually come across it. No, but I am looking for the bunny house. Um, <laughs> you know something? That's how old I am, man. I I don't think the Playboy doesn't even do that shit no more. I remember like way, way back in the day, like they would have like the little Playboy bunny specials and stuff like that. They'd be hopping around and all and make it seem like anybody could join the bunny hop. And, you know, that's not the kind of hop I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, man. We don't want him in heaven. We don't want him in hell. He's too horny. 
Oh, it's no joke, people. Jay loves the women. And that's all I want to do is just mess around and have a good time and hang out with them. That's all. <laughs> you know, the extracurricular play, though, however, you know, it's just a little bit of fun stuff to happen, if you wills. So I don't feel bad about it. Hey, speaking of which, there's this um, legend right here that I've never heard of before. It's called the Himuro Palace. This legend is about a strange ritual carried out about a family who lived in the mansion. All right, so that must be the Himura Palace. Okay, let's take a listen. The family who lived there claimed for generations that the house had a portal from which evil forces would emerge. In order to avoid this strange misfortune, it was necessary to perform a strange ritual called the Strangulation Ritual, in which they had to take a newborn girl and raise her in total secrecy to prevent her from developing ties with the outside world. On the day of the ritual, the girl was tied to her wrist and ankles with ropes the ends of which were tied to four oxen or horses. And at a certain order, the animals would begin to pull one limb in a different direction, thus tearing the poor victim apart. The ropes with which she was tied were then impregnated with her blood and placed over the portal so as to prevent the evil forces from coming to earth. One day, however, something went wrong. One of the girls chosen for the ritual somehow met a boy and fell in love with him. This formed a bond with the outside world, making the girl unusable for the ritual. In this way, the Himuros would bring shame and disgrace to the family name. That's why the head of the family decided to eliminate all members of the Himuro family, killing them with a katana, and then taking his own life, and a total of seven people died. Now there are those outside who said that this house, which is in a forest outside of Tokyo, is cursed by evil forces that came out of the portal which remained open due to the failure of the ritual. Oh shit. What the hell did we step into, huh? That's wild. <laughs> I felt the chill from that one. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> oh my god. Let, 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 let. Oof. Oof. We, we might have to run away from that one, baby. We might have to run away from that one. Oh man. <laughs> I'm wondering how real it could be. Let's see. What what does it say? Oh, Curse Kleenex commercial. Uh, you know what? Let's just take a dive into it. I mean, it's not like any of y'all are really suffering right now, right? You know, I mean, you're not using Kleenex. You're using Walmart brand, right? I mean, or, you know, God knows you can't get toilet paper like anything because people were panic buying it. Nah, that ended. Never mind. Let, let's go on ahead and read it. So, Curse Kleenex commercial. Let's see. It's a Kleenex commercial that aired in Japan in 1986. In the commercial, you can see a woman dressed in white watching a child dressed as a Japanese ogre. She hands him a Kleenex handkerchief, which makes an affectionate gesture to the little ogre, and the commercial closes with the two watching a handkerchief fly away in the breeze. There are no voices in the commercial, just a background song, and it is this song that started the urban legend. The audience started claiming that the lyrics of the song were cursed in German, although the lyrics were clearly in English, and its translation was, Die, die, all are cursed and will die. It's actually the song, It's a Fine Day, by Jane and Barton. Then, rumors began to spread about the actors in the commercial. It said that the child dressed as an ogre had died, and that the actress Kiko Matsurosuka had died and was hospitalized and or given birth to an ogre child. All that in a Kleenex commercial? Damn. Okay. I I'd hate to see what would happen in some of the projects that I'd make. Whew. Alright. <laughs> this one is for all of you baseball fans out there. Because I am a Phillies fan and I am still very bitter about what the hell happened in that whole Mets thing. Um, <laughs> and that's because, like, you know, we had that shit won. Alright? They, they were no good. And then all of a sudden, Wild Card came into play, brought the Mets back, and then all of a sudden, the Mets decided to kick the crap out of us because we either got too comfortable or Thompson does not know how to run a damn ball club. It, so many things. So many things, and I'm so sore about it. But this one is called Curse of the Colonel, and it deals with baseball. All right? This urban legend is thought to be the cause of defeats of the Japanese team, the Hansen Tigers. All right, so here we go. In Japan, baseball is the most popular sport and was introduced to the country by Horace Wilson in, in 1870. By Oh, wow, he was a U.S. teacher. 
When in 1985, the Hanshin Tigers won the championship by surprise, their fans were seized with euphoria and went to celebrate on the Ishibasha Bridge on the Danton Boro Canal. Fans who looked like the players were selected and one by one jumped into the canal, but there was one problem. None of the fans looked like Randy Bass, an American player. So the fans had the brilliant idea to use the statue of Colonel Sanders. Kentucky Fried Chicken's founder, because like Bass, he was not Japanese and had a beard. So they took the statue from a store and threw it into the canal. From that moment on, the team began a series not only of defeats, but of bad results that the fans attributed to Colonel Sanders. According to them, the Colonel put a curse on the team that would not stop until after his recovery from the canal. Several attempts were made, but to no avail until 2009 when divers came across the statue. Unfortunately, however, the curse has not yet been broken because the statue still lacks the glasses in the left hand. That's too good to be true. <laughs> but you know what? I wouldn't be surprised because some people hold like certain icons to higher regards than anything, especially in other countries. Like... You know how, like, sometimes you might be tired of KFC, but you're never tired of Taco Bell? Or you might be tired of Domino's Pizza, but you're never tired of Little Caesars? Let's just say that, for instance. Because I know a lot of y'all really don't like Pizza Hut. It just doesn't hit the same like it did in the 90s. I, I get it. But over there in other countries, it's a little different because they still use the same iconic characters. And they still utilize, like, cartoons to sell to adults and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised, but once again, you know, Colonel Sanders has given us a lot and taken a lot away, and the way the menu has been going with that, are you sure it's just because the GM doesn't know what the hell he's doing? <laughs> or maybe there's just no real connection like anything? I mean, sometimes you just don't find the right people for your teams, I suppose. And now, could I say that for the Phillies? Well, I don't want to start a fight. Not now, it's Monster Fest. We can do that like later on. Which is just enough time for basketball season. And like I say, you know, there's all sorts of urban legends and monsters that we really need to discuss. And we still got plenty of time in the fest for more of them to make their appearance and a lot to dive into. So, I want to say um, I'm not responsible for any night terrors that you guys get tonight. I did try to liven it up here with a little bit of the jokes, you know. And also, you do have jams coming up, so just try to survive until then, will you? Nah, nah. Live well and be at peace. By the way, shout out to Clock Out Films. If you want to help them finish making their movie and all, check the link in the description box below. And also, check out Front Row Negative, hosted by my good friend AG. I put his link down there in the description box as well. So you guys can go ahead and take a look at the community, if you will. <laughs> And then, of course, you know, you can also check out Soda as well. Another show that I make in association with Marco and Musifer. But until then, you guys take care of yourselves. This is J-Man signing off. Thank you for joining in tonight. Peace.